What's up, Freedom Fam? How are you guys doing today? Listen, I am so grateful for all of you, and I'm so thankful that we get to walk alongside each other in this journey as we're going through and landing the plane on our series today, Leadership Lessons. And I want to start off with a statement that most sociologists would agree with, and they will say that we have become a very self-conscious and a very self-centered society. The baby boomer generation was labeled the me generation. And for all my baby boomers, my boomers, I love y'all. Y'all are great. And my aunties, my unks, I love y'all. But you were labeled the me generation. And then the generations that have followed have seemingly grown progressively more into the area of overemphasizing self. We have become preoccupied with ourselves. But we shouldn't be surprised, right? The Bible tells us that we should, have, we should expect this. This is what Paul says to Timothy. He says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. So we expect this, right? The whole world is on a quest to find the best version of themselves. I remember hearing this joke once about this woman who was at a party and she proudly declared, my husband and I have been together happily for 25 years. And, and then when she was asked, what is the key to your success? She responds, well, I guess it's because we're in love with the same man. And I don't know, I don't know that was funny or it may have been corny. I don't know how you heard that, but regardless, it is true. We live in a society that is increasingly centered on self. Now, don't get me wrong, fam. Working on yourself is not a bad thing as a whole. It's great to go to school, right, to learn more, to go to the gym, to get healthier, to go to therapy, amen, to improve on yourself and on your relationships. But, and these are all positive steps. But is that all there is to life? Are we just on one long, unending cycle of either self-critique and then self-enhancement? And what does the Bible have to say about all of this? See, the Bible reminds us in Matthew 6, and this is a life verse for me, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So the scripture is basically saying that while personal development is important, True fulfillment and direction comes from seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness first. So, today I want to narrow our focus a little bit. Um, and then we're going to be, again, landing this plane on this series of leadership lessons. And one crucial aspect of effective leadership is understanding our dependency on God. See, David's life offers profound insights into this principle. How did his reliance on God shape his leadership and his legacy? And so how can we too now learn how to depend on God in every aspect of our lives? So we're going to tease this out some more in, um, in today's message as we walk through 2 Samuel chapter 7. And um, we're going to break it down a little bit differently today. We're going to break it down, um, this chapter, into five segments. And then we're going to look at one principle from each section. Is that all right? All right. So, and again, these principles are not just for those biblical times, but they are timeless truths that can guide us in, in, in how we lead ourselves and how we lead others today. So let's shift our focus. Let's dive in so we can shift our focus from self to God. And hopefully God will show us how we can find true fulfillment in his plans for us. And we'll be able to see that it's not about me. Can we say it's not about me? It's about God. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts and we're turning our focus to you now. Lord, as we dive into your word, would you open our hearts? Would you open our minds to understand your plans for us? God, may we leave here transformed by your truth, ready to live out what you reveal to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So talking about principles, the first principle, number one, remember. Can we say Remember. Remember that every success is a gift of God's grace. So let's read 2 Samuel. We're going to start in verse 1 together. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all surrounding enemies, the king summoned the prophet. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. See, by the time these events in 2 Samuel um, 7 occurred, 
things are going really well for David, right? Like, I mean, he has completed his own palace. He's now living in royal splendor. And God has given David and the nation of Israel peace from all their enemies, right? So now he's desiring to build a house for the Ark of the Covenant, which is where the presence of God was dwelling. And so though some theologians would differ on whether David was being falsely or authentically humble in this moment, I actually believe, in my opinion, David um, should be commended for his response in this moment. See, I believe David was really out here acknowledging that like, all that his successes and his peaceful circumstance are a direct result of God's grace and his provision. So this passage really kicks off a reminder for us to, to stop and to remember that every achievement and blessing in our lives comes from God. I mean, David sitting here, like if you can imagine him saying, like, look, look at what I'm experiencing. And the thing that has given me this experience is right over there. So he's sitting here in this acknowledgement. And I think it's important for us to also remember how to do this. This is reflecting on this. I was reminded of my grandma and what she used to sing at her church at, at, uh, in, in Cobbler, North Carolina. She was singing, if you know this, you can say it with me. As I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I got a what? Testimony. Yes. Come on. Anybody got a testimony in the room? Listen, it's important to stop and to acknowledge that God's doing the heavy lifting and we are ex when we are experiencing success of any kind. When I think about this, you know, I can't help but to think back to my school days <clears throat> and my utter disdain for group projects. Why? Because there was always that one person who contributed the least but somehow managed to get the same credit as everybody else. You know what I'm talking about? It used to drive me crazy. And I've always felt that it was unfair for someone to benefit without putting in the work. And listen, I was a straight-A student, so it used to really mess me up. So yet now with this fresh revelation, I see how this mirrors our relationship with God. So just as I begrudgingly share credit in these group projects, I must acknowledge that my successes are not solely my own. God has been doing the heavy lifting all along, orchestrating every detail and blessing beyond my capabilities. And look, that's just his nature, right? Down to the giving of his son and his son's work on the cross. Here's the formula, guys. He works and we win. Listen, he works and we win. He gives all and we are the recipients of the undeserved credit. That is grace, my friend. Anybody thankful for the grace of God today? Listen, this recollection, remembering, it has shifted my perspective, helping me to see that just as I had to share credit in school, I must give God the credit in my life. I must recognize his grace and provision in all of my achievements. I really like Paul's word on this subject. This is what Paul says, and he made it real plain. Um, Paul was real hood in this one. Let's, let's go with me here. First Corinthians 4, Paul says, what makes you better than anyone else? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why boast as though you have accomplished something on your own? So that'll, that'll preach right there. Psalm 127 says this. It reinforces this truth. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. It's in this verse. It echoes the sentiment that without God's blessing, our efforts are futile. So what do you do to remember well? Number one, you start each day with thanksgiving. Listen, even if you're not a religious person, one of the most helpful, I mean, honestly, no matter where you are in your journey, one of the most helpful practices that you can cultivate is a life of gratitude. So maybe you're in a place where you're still trying to figure out things about God, or, or maybe you're a seasoned saint. I just want to challenge you today to give, just for 30 days, if you would give God thanks every day when you wake up for the next 30 days and see if it will not change your life. Start each day acknowledging God's role in your life. Start each day asking for God's guidance in your work and in your responsibilities. See, these practices will help you cultivate gratitude and depend more on God's wisdom than your own understanding. This is 1 Thessalonians. This is what it says. Rejoice always. Pray continually. 
Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Again, family, it's not about us, because every success is a gift of God's grace. So first, we remember. And now, number two, we refuse. Can we say refuse? We refuse to presume to know God's heart. So let's read, starting in verse three here. Again, David has just said what he said about wanting to give God something. And and Nathan replies to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Now, excuse me, now as David's pastor, Nathan fell into the trap that many pastors often fall into, right? When someone goes from getting to giving, from consuming to contributing, look, our natural response, just like Nathan's, is a sense of relief, right? You're like, you, what do you mean? I don't have to do 17 teen campaigns. I don't have to get up here and do a song and dance for you to, you actually want to give of your own volition? And it's not you guys. You guys do that. You guys are amazing. You guys are great. But what I'm saying here is that we, it's easy for us to assume that this must be God's heart. And, and that's what Nathan was doing here. But we quickly find that it isn't true. No sooner had Nathan advised David to go ahead and proceed with his plans, and God comes out, of, out on the scene, and God makes it very clear that Nathan and David, both of y'all, don't know my heart on this matter. Listen, it's not just pastors who are prone to this problem. So many times we make our plans first and we just proceed with them without ever consulting God to see if that is really what his heart is for us. So, Pastor Jeremy, how do I know what God's heart is for me? How do I make sure I'm not presuming to know his heart when I don't have, even have a clue? Listen, it's fully, um, to fully answer that question, I mean... I, I would need another 30 minutes, and I don't know if you guys want another 30 minutes with me up here. But I will like to give you a short answer today. And first, let me say this, that the casual follower of Jesus is going to have a hard time discovering the heart of God. Listen, it's like, I'm going to be a little provocative here for a moment. It's like swiping right on God, right, but then never showing up for the date. You know, or like, let me, let me break it down a little bit differently. It's like trying to unlock your phone with a stranger's fingerprint. See, you're never going to get access to the, to the things of God's heart. You're never going to get to the depths of his heart if you're just being a casual follower of his. As Paul wrote in Romans 11, oh, what wonderful, what a wonderful God we have. How great are his riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions excuse me, and his methods. For who can know what the Lord is thinking? Who knows enough to be his counselor? There is a sense here, right, in which we can never fully understand the heart of God because he is God. He is not a human being. But the Bible is also clear that when we seek God, when we focus our attention on him and and focus our attention on delighting in him, God chooses to reveal himself to us, at least in part. So this desire to completely um, delight in God may very well be the attribute that most made David a man after God's own heart. And so God wants us to delight in his word like David did, meditating on it day and night, family. And when we do that, God is able to reveal himself through his word as, as his Holy Spirit guides us into the truth of his heart. It's the book of Psalms kicks it off, verse 1, chapter 1, like this. This is what it says. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prosperous. I don't know about you, but I want a shirt that says WTDP. I want it to be a WTDP people. What is that, Pastor Jeremy? It is a whatever they do, prosperous type of people. Anybody want to be that with me? Not because we're so great and you guys are great. You guys have great talents and skills. It's not, but it's not because of that. It's not because we have these perfect plans, right? No, it's because God chose 
us. And now we get to choose to delight in him every day. We get to choose to meditate on his word every day. This is how we can prosper, family. We fix our eyes on him, right? And now we're rooted, and now we're unshaken, and now we're able to produce fruit in every season. Anybody want a WDDP shirt with me? Yeah, come on. And as Second Timothy says, this word we're talking about, delighting in, right, it is God breathed. Right? And it is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Again, in every season, everything that we do, we delight in this word. We can be a people that prosper with God. So we have to refuse. Can we say refuse? Refuse to presume to know God's heart but delight in meditating on his word to find out his heart. Amen? Number three, recognize. Can we say recognize? Recognize that God must build my house before I can build his house. So we're going to pick up here in verse five. This is God talking to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have, and I have cut you off, cut off all of your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. See, David's coming to God, offering to build God a house, but God isn't interested in what David can do for him. He's much more interested in what he wants to do for David. He's like, look, David, I don't need a house. I never wanted a house. I never asked for a house. Matter of fact, I don't, you, I don't want to be boxed in. I'm not, I don't want to be in the building. But David, I love you so much that I'm going to build a house for you. And not just some temporary structure, but an eternal house that will never pass away. And this passage is, is what is, we, we now know what, what theologians will call the Davidic covenant. And God has made a lot of covenants in, um, with his people. These are sacred two-party agreements that, that God has made in the Bible, and there are a lot of them. But in this particular covenant, God promises David that he will build a house for David and that David's house and his throne will endure forever. And so God promises that one day his offspring right, will succeed David, and he will be the one to build a house. And God made good on his part of this agreement, because Solomon was the one who actually built the temple. And ultimately, God's covenant with David was fulfilled again when Jesus, who the Bible clearly shows as David's offspring, returns to the earth and reigns forever. So God makes good on his covenant. So for about four out of the last five years of my life, I have been technically what um, people would call uh, a church planter, and um, working to start Freedom Church Cherry Hill, whoop, whoop, you know, and then um, what it was now Freedom Church Merchantville, where you guys are right now, and then you throw in online church during COVID for almost two years, and there's a lot of church planning involved, and over that time period, I came up with a lot of plans, I should say, develop a lot of goals, and a lot of strategies to try to reach those goals, and our church tried a ton of strategies to reach the lost and to develop leaders during those years. And, and I can't speak for, we'll be vulnerable here, I can't speak for anybody else's soul on my team, but it seemed to me that no matter what we tried, though there was some success, it really seemed that, that my reality did not quite match my expectations. Listen, there were a ton of testimonies, a ton of salvations. God was doing good work, and there was good through it all. But there was always this yo-yo effect in me inwardly that, um, and I'm just trying, I just want to make this clear for you guys and bring this point home. See, things could go well for a while, and then, boom, we didn't have any power, right? And then, boom, there was no internet in the theater. And then, then, boom, there was a pandemic. And then, there was no AMC at all. 
right? And then we buy this building and we're moving. And then in the middle of this, our, our teammate and my, my, right, my right hand girl, Autumn, tragically, and she suddenly passes away. And then other staff members and key, and key leaders and, and key families were beginning to transition out to go to different places and just felt like we were going backwards for a while. And from my perspective, in the moment, it seemed like there was more failure than there was favor. But not from God's perspective, family. See, what I didn't see at the time, but it was clearly, a, a, it's clearly apparent now, is that God was using that time to build my house. Can we say build my house? Listen, he knew that before he could really use me the way he wanted to to help build his house in his kingdom, he had to do a work in my life. Now, God used that time to humble me, to develop some attitudes and some skills and some gifts in my life that he could use for his kingdom. Not that he wasn't using me before, but there was a thing that God wanted to do in my life to bring me to a better place, a stronger place. The guy you see in front of you today would not have existed if it wouldn't have been for these last four or five years. See, God had a purpose and God has a plan for our lives even when we do not see it immediately. He uses all of our experiences, including the difficult times, to prepare us and develop qualities within us that are necessary for his greater purpose. So family, as you reflect on your journey today, perhaps you too have experienced seasons that seem filled with more setbacks than successes. And it's important to remember, it's important to remember that God's perspective on our lives is vastly different than our own. And just like as he was challenging me in times of my life to shape me and to prepare me, he is actively working on you as well. So allow him to build your house first. Let him develop your character. Let him nurture your skills. Let him reveal gifts that he intends to use for his kingdom's purposes. And you you can surrender to his guiding hand and you let him lead you into a deeper understanding of who he is, God will transform you, and you will see yourself set up in a, in a house built by him to then help him build his house. So can we just give you some, I want to give you some encouraging scriptures this morning. Is that okay? Can I just give you some, the thing that's going to help us, these things, if you can write them down, they can be um, memory verses for you. When you're going through these moments that God is building, you can't quite see. I want you to hang on to these. Can we go through them? Let this principle of letting God build your house sink in. Let's start in Romans 8, 28. Let's let, this, let the scriptures speak to us this morning. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel. I'm talking about the truth of God's word, that he has a plan for your life. Philippians 1, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I'm going to go down to Hebrews 12, 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful later on. However, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Lastly, 1 Peter 5.10 says, And the God of all grace, the God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. Can we give God thanks for the reading of his word today? We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. We recognize that you're building this house. Number four, retreat. Can we say retreat? Retreat into God's presence. We're going to read Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel 7, starting in verse 17. So Nathan, you know, God is giving him, this is what the Lord has said. Thus saith the Lord. So then Nathan reported all to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. See, Nathan reveals God's response um, to David's plans to David. And the account tells us that David went in and sat before the Lord. And see, this translation does not do it justice of what's happening here. Because this word sat actually means to dwell, to abide. 
to remain. So David didn't just go into the tent and sit down for a few moments, family. No, he retreated into God's presence and he remained there for quite some time. This was not just some casual, brief encounter with God. It was a prolonged period of time where David could just focus on God. See, unfortunately for many of us, when our plans fail, that is the, probably the last thing that we do. And I know because I've been there many times myself. What do we usually do, right? Sometimes we figure, well, the plan was good, right? But the execution was a little bit off. So let's just put in a little more effort with the same plan. But we soon find out what Ben Franklin said, has said all along that was right, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And see, sometimes then we figure, oh, well, the overall plan is good, right? But it just needs a little tweaking, right? So then we go back and we modify the plan and we try again. I'm a planner, so this is all happening for me. All of these things are happening for me. And sometimes we, we figure out the plan is wrong. So we start, start over from scratch and we make new plans and we try again. But ultimately, and this is what the, the scriptures reveal to us, is that any of a man's plans, they're doomed to failure or to some level of ineffectiveness. If it, is, if it is not also God's plan. So instead of making new plans, we need to do what David did and just go into God's presence and stay there for a little while. Basically, what, this is what, look, this is just past Juneteenth. So I'm going to give you a Juneteenth saying that we say, sat down, okay? We need to sit down somewhere and allow ourselves to hear from God and focus on him, okay? And so when David retreated into God's presence, what happened? He discovered something about the truth of God's, about where God wanted to dwell and who he was and what God was trying to do. And he discovered that all true worship begins, not in a spectacular building, but in focusing on the greatness and the grace of our God. Listen, back at college, um, I had a huge crush on um, a classmate, and we're, gonna, we're just going to call her Shantae for today, just to protect the, in, the innocent. Um, and so... <laughs> After mustering up some courage to ask her out, um, she kindly, but decidedly and firmly rejected me, right? Um, um, I don't like rejection, just FYI. Um, and it was awkward, but I tried to handle it as gracefully as any 20-year-old could and would, right? However, fate had a cruel sense of humor for me. Right, our next semester schedule, we had two classes together that both involved labs and projects that we had to spend hours together in the library. We both chaired the same committee that are in, in our sister and brother Greek organization, so we had to spend a lot of time in meetings together. See, I couldn't escape her rejection or her presence. It was, it was like, it was like being trapped in a horrible Hallmark romantic comedy with the worst possible ending. And listen, and, and, but despite all, you know, the initial discomfort, we managed to laugh about it later, realizing how ridiculous this whole situation was. And in all seriousness, though, this is kind of what David is experiencing. But by choice, right? God, listen, God has said to David's plans, no. But David is still going right to where God is. Listen, that'll preach all by itself. But perhaps you've experienced rejection. Or you felt abandoned, much like my awkward college encounter. Or maybe it's been a much more serious rejection or sense of abandonment. Or maybe it's been a painful no or a not yet from God. And see, it's during these challenging times that retreating into God's presence becomes crucial for us, family. Psalm 73, you've heard me preach this a lot of times because it is a life chapter for me. Um, because it's a powerful example of how to, how to retreat to God and how to understand how to lean in when you're facing disappointment. And maybe I've just faced a lot of disappointment and disillusionment in my life. But I have needed this passage more times than I can count. And said so at the beginning of this psalm, Asaph, he's expressing his doubts. He's wrestling with God about what he's seeing and this, his disillusionment and his confusion at the, at the apparent prosperity of the wicked. And yet, as Asaph has discovered in this moment, let me backtrack here because I just want to make sure you guys are, are, are really walking this out with me and understanding what I'm saying because I, too often... In our moments, I just want to make sure there's some similarity and grounding here because I want you to understand that we face moments of rejection and disappointment, and it is easy to feel like God has abandoned you. 
It's easy to feel like God has overlooked you and overlooked your desires. And so that's what this passage is talking about here. And so Asaph is discovering that our perspective can shift when we enter into God's presence. Our perspective can shift when we enter in God's presence. Verse 17 marks a turning point for Asaph. He says, till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. See, it's there in God's presence that Asaph gained clarity and found peace in God and solace of what God's plan was ultimately going to come to pass. And so just as he retreated into God's presence and gained perspective, family, you too can find solace and renew hope by drawing near to God. Allow him, as you take refuge in him, to heal your heart and lead you into a deeper understanding into the plans for your life. Listen, I'm still a slow learner in this, but little by little, when I say little, it, I mean, I'm 42. I mean, little by little, I'm figuring out that my time in the presence of God, my time retreating into God's presence is far more crucial to the things God has put before me and to my ministry than any classes, than any trainings, than any mission statement, than any strategies I can develop, any plans I can come up with. And that's for all of us. We got to retreat to his presence. Can we say retreat? Thank you. All right. Finally, respond. Can we say respond this morning? Yes, respond to God's revelation. Let's read starting in verse 19. Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And this is David talking to God. And it's If this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, sovereign Lord. For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. I love David's prayer here. David doesn't focus for one second on the fact that God has just withdrawn the building permit for the house that David was planning to build for him. Instead, he spends all his time focusing on what God has just revealed to him. He humbles himself before God, and he thanks God for the promises he has just made to him. And then, we haven't read this part in verse 25, I didn't read this, but he prays and he asks that God will be faithful and that he would keep these new promises that he just revealed to him. See, everything in this prayer is a direct response to what God has just revealed to David. It's a prayer that focuses completely on God and on his purposes and his plans for David's life. See, there's going to be two no's that we're going to get when we, when we are in, in the presence of the Lord. We're going to get a no, an N-O, or we're going to get a K-N-O-W. And these two things, they're going to be opposing each other sometimes. You're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to focus on the no that I'm hearing, or am I going to focus on the no, what God is revealing himself, what, God, what the promises God is actually saying? This is what you can know about me. And I'm saying, guys, if we can choose the K-N-O-W. If we can choose the no, I'm convinced we are not very good at this. May we come into God's presence, we read his word and and, and what he reveals to himself and his purposes and his plans. And then we turn around, we turn around and we completely ignore what we have just learned from God, especially if it involves discomfort, especially if it involves delayed desires. And it's okay for us to pray for our needs, family. It's okay for us to pray for the needs of others. In fact, we're instructed to do so. But if that is the extent of our prayer life, then prayer becomes all about me and not about God. So when I pray, I need to respond to God. What can I know about God today? What can I K-N-O-W, I can't spell, know about God today? Maybe there is some attribute, some character of his, of his that I can praise him for that is now a new revelation for me in my life. Maybe there's some work he's doing in my life that I can thank him for. Maybe there's some sin in my life that he is revealing to me that I now need to confess and repent of. Maybe there's, there's a principle that I need to apply. Maybe like something that's happening today that I need to ask God to help me to obey him. And when I pray, it needs to be about God and not just about me. Some Rick Warren He begins his best-selling book, The Purpose-Driven Life, with these words. And um, if you haven't read this book, I mean, 
no matter where you are in your journey, just you, this is a, a book that should just be in everybody's staple, I believe. And he says this, this is how he kicks it off. It's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. See, David knew that this was true over 3,000 years ago. And as a result, he became the man after God's own heart. And I believe we need to follow in his footsteps. It's not about me. It's about God. It's not about me. It's about God. God leading us. God blessing us. God directing us. God giving us purpose. God building something in us. It all comes back to him. So let's remember that every success is a gift of his grace. Let's refuse to presume to know God's heart, family, but delight in his words so that we can know his heart. Spend time recognizing the house that God is building in you so that you can be effective for him. Retreat into his presence often. and Respond to his revelation. As we close here, I'm looking back um, into this message. I want to give us practically some questions to consider as we, before we start to respond in worship today. Here's some questions for you. What successes have you experienced that might tempt you to ignore God in your life? Let's take a moment right now and just begin to think about those, even begin to thank God for those successes. Thank you, Lord. Number two, what parts of my house does God want to build? How can I yield my life to God in those areas? Finally, what practical steps can I take to make sure to spend time in God's presence? Let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your word and your truth. It's not about us. It's all about you. Lord, we acknowledge today every success is a gift of your grace. God, and we desire to seek you in your heart earnestly. Lord, help us to seek you in your heart earnestly. Let us build our lives according to your plan, not ours. Lord, and just as you were faithful to David, we know that you are the same God today. You never change, and your promises remain true. So as we face any battle and any challenge, God, remind us that you are with us just as you were with those who came before us. And Lord, we recognize that we can't fully understand your heart or achieve a lasting success on our own. And maybe there's someone here who's just getting that revelation today, and that's you, and you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm inviting you to open your hearts to him now. Look, we believe that you came and you died and you rose again to give us life and to build something eternal in us. So we ask that you come into our hearts. Forgive us our sins, Lord, and lead our lives. That is the gospel. And it's the only gospel that we preach today, that we receive today, Lord. We choose to follow you and trust you in your unchanging love. Lord, as we go from here, empower us to live out these truths, remembering that our purpose and our fulfillment, that it comes from you. Let us be mindful of your presence, and knowing that you are the same God who led David, and you're leading us today. Help us, God, that we build our lives on you and nothing else. It's all about you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.